Hello, this is William Lugo from Muslim Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles. I want to read to you an old James Taylor song called Fire and Rain. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times when I could not find a friend, but I always thought I'd see you again. I read to you from Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. What a wonderful verse, three verses these are. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says the word redeem, translated gael, literally means to buy out of slavery. God is the Redeemer of Israel. This is a title that's used 13 times in Isaiah alone. God is also our Redeemer. He has bought us, redeemed us out of Egypt, which is symbolic for sin. So he has redeemed us out of the slavery of sin. God formed the church. We are God's people. The church belongs to him. He established the institution of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Jesus shed his blood for the church. Church is his bride and that's us. Jesus is our groom. We belong to him. He has called us by name. God is a personal God. He knows everything we go through. We are His. We belong to Him. Verse 2 when, is for, can refer back to when God saved the Israelites. He parted the Red Sea. They were not overwhelmed. They walked through the waters. God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown into the fire furnace for worshiping God alone. Last thing I want to share with you a quote by Hudson Taylor, great missionary to China. Hudson Taylor said, God is not looking for men of great faith. He is looking for common men to trust his great faithfulness. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we belong to you. You call us by name and no trial, no flood, no fire, no pestilence or pandemic can overwhelm us. Help us to trust in your faithfulness day by day, moment by moment, because we thank you and pray for, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
title of our message is No Room in the Inn, taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On April 14, 1865, America went to bed, thankful that the long, bloody civil war was over. It, 
in the Civil War, over 200,000 people died. But America awoke the next morning to discover that President Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. On December 6, 1941, America went to bed, watching war spread over Europe and over Asia as Nazi Germany was taking over almost all of Europe. And Americans were thankful that they were not in the World War because they had the Atlantic Ocean insulating them on this side and the Pacific Ocean insulating them from the war on the other side. The next morning was December 7th, 1941, the date that will live on in infamy when America found out about the surprise bombing on Pearl Harbor by Japan. They came to realize that they could not avoid being in the war any longer. On June 5th, 1944, the world went to bed wondering if anyone could stop Nazi Germany from taking over all of Europe and spreading the, uh, his empire further and further. But the very next morning, America woke up to hear the news of the Allied invasion on Normandy on D-Day. These are historic events that changed the world. And there are some events in our history that turn our world upside down and can forever change our lives. Let's look at the Bible. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea in Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Verse 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds lying out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The Expositor's Bible Commentary tells us that Luke emphasizes three things. One, the political situation to explain why Jesus' birth took place in Bethlehem. Two, that Bethlehem was the town of David to stress Jesus' messianic claim. And three, the humble circumstances of the birth of Jesus Christ. He is establishing a contrast between the proper rights of the Messiah in his own town of David and the very ordinary and humble circumstances of his birth. Even in his birth, Jesus was excluded from the normal shelter that other people enjoyed. Luke 9:58, Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This is consistent with Luke's presentation of Jesus' humanity and servanthood. Before I read verses about Bethlehem, I want to share with you someone shared with me that we should have the right order of things. And I gave the illustration of a train. In the train, the very first car is the engine, and that's where they shovel coal into the fire to make steam to drive the wheels to pull the rest of the train. And that represents the fact, the fact that Jesus was born in a time and place, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, the fact that he rose again from the dead and people witnessed this, after the engine comes the passenger cars or the freight cars. That represents our faith. So fact comes first and we put our faith in Jesus and the historicity of Jesus dying on the cross for us. The last car is the caboose, which represents our feelings. So our feelings go up and down. Sometimes we have doubts, sometimes we're sure, but feelings come last. Fact is first, faith is second, and feelings are last. Micah 5.2 
is the messianic prophecy that predicts that Jesus would be born, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So this could only refer to the Messiah, to God, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Matthew 2, 4 and 6, when he, the awful King Herod, called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. They replied, in Bethlehem in Judea. Of course, Herod gave the excuse, well, I want to know so I can come worship him. What an awful liar. What a terrible person. He really wanted to murder the baby Jesus. And when they couldn't find him, he ordered all the boys who were two years and under to be slaughtered, the slaughter of the innocents, because he was a murderous and wicked king. The scribes understood it. The common people understood it. In John 7, 42, the people say, does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Bethlehem means house of bread. And so it's fitting that Jesus is the bread of life. John 6, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go spiritually hungry. He who believes in me will never be spiritually thirsty. Jesus humbled himself. He was born in Bethlehem, the town of David. Jerusalem is called the city of David, but he wasn't born there. He was born in poverty, in humility, and later on he will rule in Zion. Luke was not only a historian, but also a medical doctor, and he was careful to note the rulers at the time. The emperor was Octavianus Caesar Augustus. He's the nephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar died and he inherited the, the being emperor. He took on the name Augustus, which means honorable, called himself honorable. And that's where we get the month August from. Jesus was born poor. He didn't have lots of money and have rich parents to buy him anything he wants. Sometimes that's what the world thinks. Boy, if my parents were rich, they'd just buy me this and buy me that. Instead, Jesus had parents who love God. So it is better to have parents who are poor and love God than to have parents who are rich and don't love God. And we are blessed as children if our parents love God themselves and teach us to love God and worship him. Luke 2, 7 tells us she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the Christmas narrative, King Herod was a villain, was a murderer. The wise men, the shepherds were the good guys. The innkeeper sounds like an old man who's heartless and cruel. In the end, they probably had 12 rooms and they were all filled up. Now, it's not really the innkeeper's fault that there were no more rooms. It wasn't his fault that Caesar Augustus was going to tax the Roman world and issued, for, uh, issued the decree and ordered everybody to be counted. It is, wasn't the innkeeper's fault that Mary and Joseph were the last ones and all the rooms were taken. But this phrase, there was no room in the inn, almost becomes a recurring theme in the Gospel of Luke because it occurred throughout the ministry of Jesus. Let's look at our first point. There was no room for Jesus in the financial world, in the business world, in the world of working people trying to make money, the economy of jobs, trades, and services where money is most important, there was no room for Jesus. We read Luke 2, 7 already. Luke 8, 27, 29, 36 tells us, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but lived in tombs. The guy was naked all the time, verse 29. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. 
Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Those who had seen, seen it, meaning Jesus driving out the demons, told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. You would think, here's this crazy man who's demon-possessed, so strong that he broke the chains, naked all the time, probably screaming and violent, and he had more than one demon. Jesus asked him, and he said, my name is Legion. He had lots of demons in him, and ironically enough, the demons would drive him into solitude. He couldn't live in the town. He couldn't live with the family or friends, couldn't do anything with friends, the demons were inside of him and drove him into the solitary places. Jesus cast the demons out, and you would think the people would stop and say, wow, he's not violent, he's not crazy anymore. He, you know, they, they, they went over there, and there was this man sitting at Jesus' feet. He had clothes on, he was calm, he was in, in good mental health because he was not possessed by demons anymore. They didn't thank Jesus and praise God. They didn't like, build a hospital and, and name it after Jesus and celebrate. Instead, they sent people and said, Jesus, would you please leave because you killed all these pigs and you're affecting our town's uh, economic status and people lost money because the herd of swine went over the cliff and they all died. They wanted business as usual. They wanted the town to be prosperous and make money. They said, Jesus, go somewhere else. Think about the emotions of this demon-possessed man's wife, if he had wife and kids, and, and if he didn't and he had a mother. If he walked down the streets and went back to the town and the wife saw him and the children saw him, they would say, quick, run and hide. And then they would be so scared of him because he's violent. I mean, the man was naked and screaming and yelling and breaking chains. And yet, after Jesus cast out demons, he could go to his wife with clothes on and calmly say, this is what God has done for me. He wanted to actually follow Jesus. But Jesus says, no, I want you to go to the town and tell them what God has done. And how Jesus has cast out the demons and healed you. And so the wife would look at him and say, this is really you. Are you really the same person are you the person i married or are you the crazy person possessed by demons and he would sit down and talk to them and in a calm voice the children could come and talk to him and say this is really our father and he's really been healed by jesus christ the people said to jesus please go away they didn't recognize or appreciate who jesus was they're more concerned about their pigs being killed, uh, killing themselves, running off the cliff and drowning. They were more concerned about money and they had no room for Jesus in their village. In World War II, Germany bombed England day and night. And there was one particular Lutheran church that took a direct hit from one of the bombs and it just destroyed the whole church except for the front wall. The front of the church and the front door remained you know, very precariously, but the rest of the church was destroyed. So on Sunday morning, the pastor came and he stood in the front door and he read scripture and he tried to encourage the people to have faith in God. A man walking by said, preacher, put the book away. You preachers talk about hell. Hell is right here. Look around you. This is hell. The pastor said, sir, this is not hell. Here's a church there are no churches in hell. Here's a Bible. There are no Bibles in hell. And here is someone, me, inviting you to come to Jesus. There is no one in hell who will invite you to come to Jesus. Even in a terrible war or a prolonged pandemic, Jesus is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But there was no room for Jesus in the economic world, in the world of making money. So the takeaway is for us not to be so caught up in making money 
being successful in our jobs or career, and we neglect the more important things in life, your relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Our second point is that there was no room for Jesus in the religious establishment. Among the spiritual leaders, the teachers, the priests, the worship leaders, they had no room and they could not accept Jesus Christ. The pastors and the teachers at that time opposed Jesus and did not accept him. Luke 20 verse 1 and 2, one day as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Luke 22 verse 2, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus. John 1, 10 and 11, Jesus was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. There was no room for Jesus among the established religious leaders. That would sound strange because you would think they would want to learn from Jesus, but they were threatened or for whatever reason, they would not accept him. People like Annas and Caiaphas, they already held the high positions. Israel had all the high priests that they needed, probably more. And here's this new person who calls himself a teacher or a rabbi. Where did he go to school of theology? Who were his parents? Where does he give his authority? Jesus was a traveling preacher, but he didn't go to the school of an established rabbi. John the Baptist similarly had a negative resume. You see, usually on a job or a school application, you list down where you went to school, what degree you got, where you were previously employed, what your job title was, what you did at your previous job. And they asked John the Baptist, are you the Messiah? He said, I am not. He said, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. And they, you know, they would ask him, he said, I'm not. Well, who are you? I'm just a voice. It's kind of like somebody comes in, in the old days come after school and go to the kitchen open the fridge and help themselves and they kind of make a mess and then mom comes home looks at the kitchen and says who spilled juice on the floor it's all sticky who's got crumbs all over the table and then one by one the kids go not me not me not me i didn't do it and of course no one confesses up not me not me not me same thing with john the baptist are you elijah no not elijah not the Messiah. Who are you? Just the voice. Jesus wasn't the disciple of a famous rabbi or a famous scholar. He never held an office of the religious establishment of that time. The chief priests didn't welcome Jesus. In fact, they did everything they could to keep him out. They opposed him and they arranged for Jesus to die on the cross at Calvary. They could not accept him. Our third point is that there was no room for Jesus in politics. Jesus did not want to be the king of Israel at this time. He did not want to change the world by worldly governments, the laws and the courts and the kingly rulership of the people. In John 6, 14, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate, Jesus answered. You are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus knew his purpose. He said, for this I was born, to testify to the truth, that God is king, that God loves us, and that the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. 
there's a woman who once wanted peace in the world, so many wars, so many people dying, and also peace in her heart. And obviously she's very frustrated because the world is it's like terrible things happening and her personal life wasn't that great. So she went shopping and she went to the store and she was surprised to see Jesus there behind the counter. And she kept looking at him, looking at him. And then finally she got the nerve and walked up and said, excuse me, but are you Jesus? Jesus said, I am. The lady said, well, do you work here? Jesus says, well, in a way I own the store. And then the lady says, well, what do you sell here? Jesus says, just about everything. And Jesus told her, you can walk up and down the aisle and make a list of everything you want and then come back to me and give me the list and I'll see what I can do for you. Well, that's what she did. She went down this aisle and that aisle. She had a piece of paper and she wrote down so many things. Uh, peace on earth, no more war, no more hunger, no more poverty, peace in the family, harmony among people, no more fighting, no more drugs, uh, careful use of resources, no more wasting electricity or wasting energy. And then she went back to the counter with this long, long list of things that she wanted. Jesus took the list, looked at it, smiled at her and said, no problem. Then he bent down behind the counter and he picked out all sorts of things. And then he brought them up and he laid these little packets, like little envelopes on the counter. And the woman said, well, what are these things? Jesus said, seed packets. This is a catalog store. And the woman said, what? Well, I, I don't want seeds. I want, you know, world peace and peace for everyone. Jesus said, this store is a place of dreams. You come and see what it looks like. And I give you the seeds. You go home and plant the seeds. You water them, you nurture them, help them to grow. And then someday someone else reaps the benefits. She said, oh, and then she walked out the store without buying anything. John the Baptist understood that he was planting seeds. Same with Jesus. He would not see the realization of the kingdom of God while he was on earth in his earthly ministry. God's timing may not be our time, but are we willing to plant seeds, to do the work and wait on God's timing and let someone else have the fruit or the blessing of our work? Let's talk about the nature of the kingdom of God. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, throughout the New Testament, spirituality appears as the prevailing characteristic of the reign of Christ. Earthly kingdoms are based on material power, the power of the sword or guns and bombs, the power of wealth. But the kingdom of Jesus Christ is based on righteousness. Matthew 5, 24, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6.33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So Jesus is telling us how to seek his kingdom. We can seek it by seeking God's righteousness, choosing what is right and not what is easy or what is wrong. Righteousness means to do right and to choose right. And when we do that, we are seeking his kingdom. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us choose right and to do right. Ask the Holy Spirit to give us peace in our hearts and joy in our lives. Hebrews 1, 8, and 9, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O, o God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. The ruling principle in earthly kingdoms is selfish or national ambition. In the kingdom of Christ, it is truth. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to choose right over wrong. 
There was no room for Jesus in the world of politics or earthly government. People wanted him to be king, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't want to be an earthly king. The only earthly crown that he received was the crown of thorns when he died on the cross for us. Mother Teresa said, pray for me that my concern for the poor will not distract me from Jesus Christ. Wow, what a great quote. And what a heart that wants Jesus to be at the center. We need to ask Jesus to be king of our hearts, king of our lives, to have first place and be in the most important place in our hearts, to love him most of all. And when we dedicate ourselves and give ourselves to God, there's celebration in heaven. Jesus said that all the angels in heaven rejoice and celebrate when one person turns from living his own life, his own way, and gives himself to God and puts Jesus first place. The angels rejoice at Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus. And when Jesus is born in your heart, you're born again. He changes everything and you put Jesus' first place in your heart. The angels rejoice also. Jesus had no room in the economic, the religious, or the political world. The innkeeper turned Jesus away. And we don't want to be like that innkeeper. He was presented with this, the innkeeper was presented with this unexpected situation. And in some ways, the innkeeper represents every person. Every person is asked, do you have room for Jesus the Messiah? Jesus comes knocking at the door of our hearts many times, many ways, through many various people and various events. The innkeeper thought Jesus was just a person. The innkeeper could have said, well, if I knew this was the Messiah, then I would have opened the door and given him my room. But instead he said, there's no room for you. And that's symbolic, or we can apply that to our lives. Sometimes we're so busy with other things other things become more important than Jesus. Our lives become so cluttered with things that are not important. So many activities, doing things that we have no time, no energy, no money, no room for Jesus. Sometimes Jesus comes to us when we least expect him. Mary and Joseph didn't come at the beginning of the rush season, but they came late at night. I mean, come on, she was pregnant. They couldn't, you know, she had, they had to go slowly. And the poor innkeeper was tired. He had a hard, he'd been working all day long. He was tired. He didn't want anybody to bother him. And the knock came on the door. And they didn't recognize who Jesus was. Don't be the innkeeper. We want to recognize Jesus working in our lives. And Jesus speaking to us and knocking on the door of our hearts. There's a woman. She was between flights at the airport. And she went to the lounge and she had a small package of cookies that she bought and a newspaper. So she sat down and started reading her newspaper because she was waiting for her flight. She got there early. And while she was reading her newspaper, there's a rustling beside her. A man, she looked, peeked out behind her newspaper and there's a man at the next, next seat. And this neatly dressed man was helping himself to her cookies on the seat next to her. Well, she didn't want to make a scene. She leaned over and took one of her own cookies. And a few minutes passed. There's more rustling. The man was opening the package and helping himself to more cookies. And she, she got flabbergasted. She was just so shocked. Then she started getting so angry. She didn't know what to say. She didn't want to blow up and lose her temper. But she was getting madder and madder. This guy's eating my cookies. Finally, it came down to the last cookie and the man split the cookie in half and pushed half toward her, ate the other half, got up and walked away. Well, she's furious. The man just ate about all my cookies, didn't even say thank you, didn't even ask permission. Well, a few minutes passed 
and they had a boarding call and they said flight 93 you know the doors were open come stand in line and so she stood in line she opened her purse to take her ticket out and then when she opened her purse she saw her package of cookies she forgotten that she put them in there they were unopened they were all there and she was terribly humbled and embarrassed she thought that man stole my cookies that was his cookies and he didn't say anything when she reached over and started eating his cookies humility and generosity that is the order of Christmas Jesus came to the humble town of Bethlehem Jesus was generous God sent Jesus Christ into the world because he loved us so much to explain who God is to explain how much he loves us to die on the cross for our sins the season of Advent gives us time to prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ we need to make time to be silent to meditate to reflect on the miracle of Christmas Brian Melody says a healthy Advent involves the desire to root out faults and the desire to grow in virtue good Christmas preparation kind of like cleaning your house before a Christmas party good Christmas preparation therefore demands both a realistic examination of conscience and confession of sins in the sacrament of reconciliation let's not be like the innkeeper who said there's no room for you let's make room in our hearts and in our everyday lives for Jesus Christ the Messiah let's bow our heavens and pray gracious Heavenly Father thank you for your generosity for your grace that you gave us Jesus Christ and even now you're willing to give us the Holy Spirit help us to choose right help us to realize what a great God you are that Jesus Christ you're the unspeakable gift you're the best gift we could ever receive we thank you and pray in Jesus name amen